I want you to take your iPad, your iPhone, your Bible, whatever you have, and you stand, and you're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I'm going to begin a series of messages called Fitness 2019. Fitness 2019. And I'm going to talk about spiritual fitness. Then next week, I want you to be here because I'm going to talk about relational fitness. Uh, the advantage frogs have over us, they can eat whatever bugs them. Amen? <laughs> but we've got to deal with people. And how can we have better relationships? That's what I'm going to talk about next Sunday. And every person needs it because we're, we're in the relationship. You say, well, but Pastor Benny, you don't understand. I'm in the hydraulic business or I'm in the, I own a salon. No, 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 no. You, you, don't, you need to understand it. You're in the people business. Because outside of people, there is no business. So it's about relationships. And then we'll be talking about uh, financial fitness. Financial fitness. You know, uh, man, uh, December, it's jingle bells. January, it's juggle bills. Amen? So that's what we're going to talk about. And then we'll talk about physical, physical fitness. I think people are, are to one of two extremes. They either idolize their body that's wrong or they ignore their body and that's wrong and we're going to talk about that and i believe these messages will help you and your family if you will come i believe that with all of my heart matthew 6 and 33 jesus said this he said but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you let us pray God, as we bow in your presence, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings, your goodness, and your grace. Meet the needs of your people, and for all you do, we'll give you glory, honor, and praise. For I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about spiritually fit. I love the new year because the new year says that we can begin again. Somebody said, though, we cannot go back and make a brand new start. We can begin right now and make a brand new end. We can begin again. Guy gets up in the morning. He's reading the newspaper. And lo and behold, in the obituary column, his name is there. He's irate. He contacts the newspaper and says, I'm very much alive. You've put me in the obituary columns. I demand a retraction. The newspaper said... Well, when we started this newspaper in 1957, we set a policy that we don't do retractions. But they said, I'll tell you what we will do. We will put you in the birth column tomorrow. <laughs> well, what the new year says is we can begin again. Let me tell you something, folks. You say God's a God of second chances, yes. He's a God of third chances. He's a God of fourth chances. He's a God of fifth chances. God is continually saying to you, you can begin again. Now, as we approach the new year, many people are making resolutions. It was interesting to me to learn of all the people that make resolutions, only 8% of the people actually achieve their resolutions. Only 8%. So while I started asking then, if only 8% achieve New Year's resolutions... How do they achieve, how does the 8% achieve their resolutions? And they were six common things. Number one, they make few resolutions. They make few resolutions. You know, uh, Dave Thomas said, uh, the founder of Wendy's, he said, only do one thing at a time and only a few, a few things in a lifetime. Orville Redenbacher said, only do one thing and do it uncommonly well. But you know, by the way, folks, this is biblical. Because Philippians 3 and 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. This one thing. If a dog chases two rabbits, they'll both escape. So, they make few resolutions. The second thing they do is uh, they make themselves accountable. They make themselves accountable. I thought that's biblical. James in 5 and 16 says, confess your faults one to another. They make themselves accountable. Number three, 
They break the goal down into a series of time-based steps. They break the goal down. And I thought that's biblical because Exodus 23 and 30 says, little by little. Folks, let me tell you something. Most of what you will accomplish in life, you will accomplish it little by little. It won't be massive leaps. It will be little by little. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, little by little. Amen? The fourth thing that they had in common is they write down their goals. Well, that's biblical. Habakkuk 2 and 2, write the vision and make it plain up on tables. Do you realize 95% of people never write down their goals? But of the 5% who do, they achieve 95% of their goals. So there's power in writing it down. Number four, regularly remind themselves of the benefits. They regularly remind themselves of the benefits. Galatians 6 and 9 says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we'll reap if we faint not. Think about it, folks. You said, boy, David went against the giant. He just, man, he was such a great man. No, no, no. Remember what he was promised? He was promised no taxes. He was promised the king's daughter. You got to stay focused on the benefits of my goal. Number six, purpose to not give up. Purpose to not give up. And Daniel 1 and 8 says Daniel purposed in his heart. Now here's all I want to say. Talking about few resolutions in 2019. I want to get spiritually fit. I want to get relationally fit, I want to get financially fit, and I want to get physically fit. There are just few resolutions. Now, there's a reason why I started out with how to get spiritually fit. Because, see, spiritual fitness is the most important part. Genesis 1 and 26 says this, let us make man in our our image. Let us make man in our image. What does it mean, let us make man in our image? Well, God is a triune God. He's one God, but he's in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's a triune God. And see whether you realized or not, You're made in the image of God. So you are a triune being. You say, explain, Pastor. Well, look what the scripture says. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body, you're a triune being. You're composed of a body. That has five senses. You touch, you taste, you smell, sound, and sight. You have a body. But not only do you have a body, but the Bible says that you have a soul. The word soul comes from the Greek word sucky. And from that word sucky, we get the word psychology. And what is the soul? The soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. So there's a body, there's a soul, but it doesn't end there. There's the spirit. And folks, the spirit is what separates you from the dog. Because the dog can't connect with God. The spirit is the part of you That connects you to God. That's why John 4 and 24 says, God is a spirit. Notice it's capitalized. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit. That's talking about the human spirit. It's not capitalized. So here's what I want you to understand. You are a spirit. (laughs) Yeah. You are a spirit that has a soul that's housed within a body. So the steps to spiritual fitness, which is the most important, 
Four simple steps. But folks, they'll revolutionize your life if you'll take these steps. They'll change your life. They'll change your life for better. Number one, step number one, is salvation security. Salvation security. Remember I said, we all have a spirit. Every person has a spirit. But look what Ephesians 2, 1 says. And ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. We all have a spirit, but that spirit is quickened or made alive when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That spirit is dead in every person, and it's only made alive through the Holy Spirit. That's why Romans 8 and 16, get this, the spirit, notice it's capitalized, itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Folks, you were a dead spirit, but when the Holy Spirit quickened your spirit, it made you alive. Here's what you got to understand. That's the confirmation for our salvation. Somebody said, Pastor, is there anything better than being saved, being a Christian? Uh-huh. Let me tell you what it is. It's being saved and knowing it. It's being saved and knowing it. A few years ago, Barbara and I went out to California. I, I preached at a church out there, and we went to the, uh, we went to the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And uh, I studied that bridge. And when it was built in 1937, I found out that building it, 23 men accidentally lost their lives. 23 men. But then they did something. They put a safety net underneath the bridge to protect the lives of the individuals. Now, when they put a safety net underneath the bridge, they noticed something. The work productivity increased by 25%. D.L. Moody said it best. He said, I've never known anyone to be good in the service of the Lord unless they first of all had the assurance of their salvation. Because ladies and gentlemen, we're not prepared to live until we're prepared to die. And that only comes through salvation security. You said, now pastor, where is that security? Well, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. <laughs> See folks, Sometimes we want to put our security in performance. I don't smoke. I don't chip. I, I, I don't smoke. I don't dip. I don't chew. I don't associate with any who do. Well, whoop de do. <laughs> Look here, folks. All I'm trying to say, how much good is good enough? I mean, I'm going to be transparent with you. Billy Graham will make it and I won't. No, no. When they give the awards out, I don't want to be anywhere near that cat. Amen? No, 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 no. I, I, I'm going to be there. I, I, always, I always envision around the throne of God, they'll, they'll, those people will be, they'll be close and they'll be around the throne of God. You say, where will you be, Benny? Be watching it on satellite. Amen? I mean... But folks, how much good is good enough? So some people are defended, dependent on performance. But you know, some people are dependent on a place. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? I say, well, one day I'm going to get to heaven. And boy, if I can get there, thank God, hallelujah, I made it. Well, wait. The angels were cast out of heaven. Now, I'm not insinuating you're going to be cast out. But I'm just saying, am I true? The angels were cast out of heaven. So your security can't be in performance. 
Your security can't be in a place. Your security's got to be in a person. <laughs> and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. See, folks, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my faith where God has put my sins on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to put my faith where God has put my sins on the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, folks, I'm talking about it. If we're going to be spiritually fit, we got to get salvation security. But let me tell you something. If we're going to get spiritually fit, we've got to get the self-esteem solution. You said, Pastor, explain. Well, get this down. You've got to base your value on the fact that you are a child of God. You've got to base your value on the fact that you are a child of God. Because the enemy wants you to base your value on other things. The enemy wants you to base your value on how people treat you. The enemy wants you to base your value on your achievements or your looks or your size or by what you uh, own. The enemy wants to base your value on all that stuff. But the problem with that is all that stuff comes and goes. All that stuff can change. Come up real close. You got to base your value on the fact that you're a child of the Most High God. See, think about this. God looks down from heaven in, in, in Luke chapter 3, verse 22. And this is what God says This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. You understand something? Jesus had not performed one miracle, He had not walked on water. He had not healed the blind man. He had not cleansed the leper. He had not done any miracles. But God said, this is my son. This is my son. And I am pleased with him. And what you've got to realize, you're a child of God. And the fact that you're a child of God, God is pleased with you. Not on the basis of what you've done. He's pleased with you on the basis you are his child. Now, the devil, the devil will come at you. Look what he, look. In, in Luke chapter 4, he tried to get Jesus to place his security in different things. First of all, he tried performance. Performance. Look what verse 3 and 4 says. Luke 4 verse 3 says, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. <laughs> Jesus said Man shall not live by bread alone. What he's saying? Why don't you perform a miracle, Jesus? Because the devil tried to get him to take his self-esteem in performance. And the devil will do the same thing to you. He'll try to get you to find your self-esteem in what you do or what you don't do. But that didn't work. So he moved on to possessions Look what he said in verse 5 and 6. And the devil taketh him up into a mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and said, all this power I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. To whomsoever I will, I give it. He said, Jesus, look at all this. I'll give all this to you. Why don't you take your self-esteem in possessions? Folks, listen to me. If you're a child of God, it doesn't matter if you're wearing Gucci or Goodwill. It doesn't matter because you're a child of God. Wait, he didn't stop there. Who moved on from performance to possessions? He said there's something else. Popularity. Oh, in verses 9 through 11, he said, Jesus, won't you just jump off this pinnacle? The angels will, get, will catch you. And all oh, you will be so popular. You'll be so popular. And the devil wants people to take their self-esteem in popularity. Let me tell you something. I, I, I know a little bit about popularity. I know a little bit. And let me tell you something. You can be a peacock one day and a feather duster the next. 
Let me tell you something. Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they said, hail him. And a few days later, they said, nail him. And let me tell you something. You don't take your self-esteem. You don't take it in performance. You don't take it in possessions. You don't take it in popularity. You take it in the fact that, oh, yes, oh, yes, I'm a child of the king. His royal blood now flows through my veins. Uh, I, love, uh, I love football. You know, most of you know I'm an avid football fan. Throughout lately, Barbara's been getting frustrated. She said, do you love me more than football? I said, college or pro, college or pro. <laughs> Tom Brady, the football player. You know Tom, Tom played in the Super Bowl. And that jersey right there, that Tom played the Super Bowl and threw those deflated passes. <laughs> that, that jersey right there sold for $500,000, $500,000. But you know what I found out? I can go online and I can buy the same jersey for $49. What made it valuable was who it belonged to. <laughs> What makes you valuable is who you belong to. Oh, yes. I'm a child of the king. Oh, ladies and gentlemen. See, if we're going to be spiritually fit, we got to get our salvation security. We got to get our self-esteem solution. But then we got to search the scriptures. We got to search the scriptures. You say, Pastor, what do you? well, that's what John 5 and 39 says. It says, search the scriptures. What it what? What do you recommend, Pastor? Get you, get you a devotional. Get you, get, you, get, you, get you a devotional. I mean, and really, folks, listen, listen. I could care less. I'm not, I mean, you can get our devotional. But listen, you get any devotional you want. Just good quality. I mean, good biblically sound. But get any devotional you want. I don't mind. Go, go out there and get them. Get the second best devotionals in America. Go ahead and do it. But I'm saying get you a devotional and every day make a commitment that I'm going to read my devotion and I'm going to read some scriptures. See, a lot of people say, Pastor, i got to read through the Bible this year. Well, I don't. It took them 1,600 years to write it. Who's to say you have to get through it in one year? What I'm trying to say to you, it's not how much you get through, it's how much gets through you. It's how much gets through you. So, so I want to encourage you to search the scriptures. I want to encourage you to pray. I want to encourage you to pray. You say, Pastor, I don't, I don't even know how to start. I don't know how to start. Well, first of all, talk to him like he's your best friend because he is. I'll tell you how to start just take your hand. You say, Pastor, what? Now that helps out. <laughs> take your hand. See the thumb? You've, you've got one, probably. <laughs> See that thumb? That's the one closest to you. In your prayer life, just start out praying for those closest to you. Start with your husband. Start with your wife. Start with your children. Start with your parents. Start with your siblings. Just pray for those closest to you. See that second finger? That's the index finger. That's the point finger. That's the point finger. Maybe pray for those that are pointing at you. That'd be your pastor. That'd be your Sunday school teacher. Folks, let me tell you something. I need your prayers. Gosh. Boy, I need the prayer and you need the practice. Amen? I mean, I really do. <laughs> and then the, then the, I mean, just the staff, just pray for our pastors. Then the, then the third finger, or, or, or second finger, actually, uh, that's the highest finger. That's the highest. Pray for those in authority. Pray for your president. You say, I don't agree with everything with the president. Well, I don't think we'll ever will any president. Yeah. But pray for your president. Pray for your governor. Pray for your mayor. Pray for your congressman. Pray for your boss. Pray for those in authority. That's biblical, by the way. 
And then the third finger, you say, Pastor, that's the weakest finger, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's the weakest finger. Pray for those that are going through weak times, whether it's physically, spiritually, emotionally, maritally, financially. Pray for those that are really going through weak times in their life. And you know tons of those. Then that little finger, pray for little old you. Pray for little old you. And that's the little finger. Pray that God will keep you humble. See, here's what I want to say, folks. Search the scriptures. I'm talking about just getting in your Bible reading, getting your devotional, praying. And folks, make up your mind this year. I'm going to be committed in church. I'm on, church is not going to be a possibility. It's going to be a priority in my life. It's going to be a priority. I'm going to make a commitment. Let me tell you, get this down. This, this is bad coming from the preacher. An older lady told me years ago, she said, Preacher, you don't want to hear this. But she said, 90% of church is habit. And I found she was correct. If you get in the habit of going, you go. If you get out of the habit, you don't. And I would encourage you, let's just make it a priority. I, I've been married 34 years. And you know, in that time, Barbara has uh, cooked a lot of meals. Great cook. I mean, she's a great cook. Uh, great cook. But you know, I can't remember the specific menu of any meal. I can't remember the specific menu. But you know what I know? I've got nourishment, strength, health from every meal. And let me tell you something about coming to church. You may not remember every song. You may not remember every message. But I'll promise you, you'll get strength and nourishment from every one. The spiritual man will be fed even when you don't realize it. Amen? That's why it's important. Now, let's say, if I'm going to get spiritually fed, I've got to have my salvation, security, self-esteem, solution, search the scriptures, and I'm done with this one. Then I've got to serve with significance. I've got to serve with significance. Nobody's saved to sit. Everybody's saved to serve. You said, Pastor Benny, I'm just a hunting a church where I can set on my blessed assurance. There's all kind of dead churches out there. Go to one of them. No, no. I want you to serve because that's where significance comes in your life. This couple here, Bill and Melinda Gates, that cat, he's worth $96 billion. Today, while we were in church, he made $33 million. He's worth $96 billion. Today, Bill and Melinda, no wonder she's smiling. Uh, Bill and Melinda, today, made $33 million. Why is he making all these trips to Africa, caring for little children with malaria? Because Bill Gates has realized Fulfillment in life comes through serving other people. You know what the difference between success and significance is? Success is about you. But significance is about other people. And I want to challenge you folks. You say, but you don't understand. No, you don't understand. I don't care what your situation in life is. We ought to all be serving other people. People. We ought to all be serving other people. My mother, uh, her name's Melba Jean, and I call mom from time to time, and I'll usually have this conversation Mama, you going to church uh, Sunday? She goes to a Presbyterian church, a small church. And sometimes I'll call mom and I'll say, Mom, are you gonna, you're going to church Sunday, aren't you? And she'll say, oh, I've got to go Sunday. I'll say, you, you got to go Sunday, Mama? She said, yes. She said, it's potluck lunch. <laughs> and I said, well, tell me about potluck lunch, Mama. She said, well, you know Brother Harry, that's the pastor, Harry Green. She said, Harry's already been to me and wants to know if I'm going to be there. Because he told me, Minnie, that none of these other women can fry the okra like you, Melba. <laughs> He's told me. He wants to make sure I'm going to be there and I'm going to bring the fried okra. I don't know about those other women, Benny. They must clearly they can't cook. 
And then I'll call her after it was over and I'll say, Mom, how'd the day go? Oh, son, my bowl, they devoured every crumb of that okra. They devoured every crumb of my okra. Now listen to me closely. I don't know that they needed the okra. But I know my mama needed to fry it. Because she needed significance. And you need significance too. And that comes only through serving other people. D.L. Moody said it best. He said, there are many of us that are willing to do great things for God, but few of us are willing to do little things for God. You want to be spiritually fit? Salvation security? Self-esteem solution? Search the scriptures and serve for significance.